Hi everybody, today's project is let's paint a travel poster. I set this as a project for people to do just so they can simplify the landscapes and maybe use crazy colours, who can say? I think you're probably all familiar with the uh, lovely tra train travel posters of the 20s and 30s and it did go on uh, through the 60s and 70s as well but you get these beautiful uh, posters done by some very well-known artists at the time and they had to use these broad flat colours as a rule because of the printing process um, so I think they were silk screen so it's very hard to reproduce a good colour photo at that time now it's all colour photos but at that time so they would go to artists and say please paint a lovely picture of Skegness or something and they did there's one of Porth Corps looking like the south of France, which I can't quite believe. So I just want to introduce you to some examples of this. Now, this is Brian Cook, Landscapes of uh, Britain. I saw fell over his uh, work um, at an exhibition at the Tate Modern, I think. And he was an artist, but he t turned out to be part of the Batsford Publishing Empire. And then um, his paintings were then transferred to this lovely... A uh, simple way of printing uh, for the backs of his books. So he did a lot of, I'm not finding them, uh, travels around Britain, if I could ever find them. Uh, oh, here we are. Here's one of his books, a design for a book. <clears throat> uh, it's a fascinating man. Having read this book, having done this and become part of the Batsford Publishing Empire, he then went on to become Sir Humphrey in government, which was rather bizarre. So here we are, here are the Batsford books, which I think we can all probably remember from our youth. But this was the guy, and this is very indicative, I suppose, of the 30s, 40s, 50s kind of illustration. But this is much more easier to reproduce than a detailed painting, so big flat colours. So we're going to try and do almost a, a landscape like a jigsaw. I've got a few others squirreled up my sleeve. Let me just show you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, ha, 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 ha. So here we are. You can see that you get these lovely um, uh, pictures of the countryside with, uh, this is quite painterly actually, but with big flat colours that can be reproduced easily. It doesn't say what year that is. This one is delightful uh, in Cornwall. Again, changing the colours, not making them completely naturalistic, which is a good thing. And then this one is a rather grisly little print. But you can see that this person's changed those colours a lot and uh, has produced a lovely landscape. So it's an idea of trying to figure out how to make um, your landscape painting a part of a design process. So you want to be able to simplify it. So when you're faced with all the leaves on the trees and everything, you really want to simplify it. So what I'm working on is this very iconic view you kind of go up to Ditchling Beacon and then walk west for a little bit and you come across this gate. I've seen this gate painted by many, many people. It's like the cottages at Cuckmere that endless people have painted this. Uh, Judy Martin, I think, has did one in her book as well. So I'm going to develop that into kind of a poster for the South Downs. I've had some ideas. Here is a poster for the South Downs. Uh, I'm not going to paint like that. I'm going to paint like me. But it's going to be... Big flat colours, but we're going to play with the, how the colours work, I think. So this is all part of the printing process, almost like a woodcut. Um, so I've done some sketches in my sketchbook to look at the view that I was working with. So I just wanted to see if it would work. So I've got the, this gate. What I'm going to do is actually stretch out the landscape as if you were even higher looking down on, the, on this because it ended up being quite a square little image. Um, and I was messing around with doing the Lorelei as well. And then I just sketched this out as well. So what I'm going to do is try and reproduce this onto my trusty layout paper. So I'm going to have a good old scribble first. And I'm going to build up the sketch. And then I'm going to transfer it to my watercolour painting surface. And I'm going to do it in watercolour. Um, now, uh, there is a medium called gouache. I don't know if people have heard of this. It's a water-soluble opaque paint. The Victorians sort of knew it as body colour. It's thick. But what it really is, is poster paint. The poster paint we used to have when we were children. And they would um, use that to paint posters. 
basically. Uh, so gouache is the posh French name. What it means is um, <clears throat> because it's an opaque colour and you use a lot of white with it, it kind of ends up a bit chalky. I'm just looking around. I do have an example here. Um, so it's sort of like acrylic, but it is still water soluble. I don't know if you can see it's got kind of a chalky surface. I'm not mad about it myself, so I'm going to use watercolour because I prefer that. But uh, this was uh, just an example of doing Cape Cod. Uh, and uh, so we're not going to use gouache, but that is the traditional medium of um, what they would have used, this sort of uh, heavy body colour. I wouldn't use acrylics because acrylics have this plasticky nature to them. Uh, well, I suppose you could use acrylics. They're pretty much the same. So you can paint, uh, you're painting in cells, really. But I will show you what I mean. I will now grab a pencil. I've lost my pencil that I really like. But I will now grab a pencil and I'm going to look at my photograph and actually begin to sketch this out and refer to my sketch as well. So this is A2 layout paper. It's that thin paper I talked about um, in when I was doing the book illustration. And I use this for all pretty much all paintings I do. So it's layout paper. It's slightly thin. You can see green through it. Let's hope. You can actually see things through it. It's not as transparent as a uh, tracing paper, but you can actually see things through it. And that's the advantage. Uh, you couldn't do this kind of thing with tracing paper because the marks you made would interfere with how you felt about things. Excuse me while I wrestle this back. To be. So here we are. I've got my eek, my reference photograph here. And I want to make a nice picture of the South Downs and you can actually turn it into a travel poster. But uh, unless you're a wizard lettering, uh, just print out the lettering. So at the end of the process, I'll be sticking that on my finished piece of art. And then the idea would go to the printers and then they would deal it. But, uh, <clears throat> but first you have to plot out your painting. And that's why I really like this layout paper. So the main thing about this, so this is an A3 shape, the outside. I've given myself a little border here. And the nice thing about using layout paper, it doesn't really matter how scribbly things are. So I just want to go in and catch the main uh, areas here. And we've got Ditchling, uh, sorry, Chanctonbury Hill, which has got a particular shape. So I want that quite high. And we can rearrange things if necessary. And then that goes down to the wield of the downs. Actually, that's a bit too wiggly. And then uh, I heard a nice phrase, actually, the whalebacks of the downs. And Sue Lim described them as bosomy, which I thought was rather good, rather typical. I'm just going to get that a little bit further out. So I've got this one here, and we've got some nice sort of square fields there. I don't want to have too much detail in the background, but you want the idea of the patchwork fields. I hope you can see what I'm doing. Can you see what I'm doing? So I'll just go a little bit darker so you can see what I'm doing. So we've got this nice thing here. And this is, allows you to be scribbly because you're on layout paper. This is not your finished painting surface. So then we've got this down doing here, mixing up with some trees. And we've got a kind of hedgerow going down there. And then another nice one, which actually goes above that, comes down, wiggles around a bit to there. And then we've got... Our, uh, we've got a nice sunny hill just there, which goes down here, and then we've got our gate here, which is also on a hill, strangely enough. And we've got that nice little path which comes in here. So as you can see, I'm being quite scribbly, getting things in there. Yeah, I think I need that to come a little bit bigger. And then I'm going to put the gate in. <clears throat> so I'm going to have the main gate here, and I can be really scribbly at this process. Oops. Make the bars go that way, and then we've got this here. And thinking about so, in this process, you can actually think about how you're going to paint the thing. And I'm just thinking here because I'm doing it watercolors, I will actually probably mask out the gate because I want the gate to be quite a prominent feature. And I might even turn it red, you never know. So, I've got a, a this five bar gate here, just want to make sure everything's okay, and then put it. We've got the uh, little fence here and there's something going on there. <clears throat> so that's my basic design. And now what I'm going to do is actually fiddle around with it and trying to bring it to something I can actually use. So what you do with layout paper, you actually just pull this off. Excuse me. Uh, 
pull this off and put this underneath. And then you can just about see through it and I should be able to actually bring my sketch together now. So here we have the gate. Can you see? So I've placed it all and it's all nice and scribbly. I've got this nice hillock here doing that, which is kind of going like that. And then it's turning around into this path and this path here is going that way. And then we're over here. So here I can put the gate in. And then I've got this uh, five bar gate here. And then I can move it around to some extent. So if I don't like this gate falling off the end, I can shift everything that way. Uh, because I haven't committed to my actual composition yet. So there's my gate and then we've got something else happening here which actually has a sense of perspective on it. And then we've got one here. Oops, maybe it's not quite that way. So that go down there. And then on this nice hill here. So I'm stretching out this area here. I want to be able to uh, imagine I was even higher up than I am and actually looking at these nice trees that are catching the light. I suppose this is looking into the light. So I've got a nice tree here and one over here and some along here and then one over here, I think, and one over here, slightly different colours like that. And so we've got some trees doing that. So I've got these nice tree shapes. And when I come to paint them, I'm going to really simplify them. So. They're nice, they're being lit from behind, so they've got quite a nice sort of almost corona of light about them. So the shape will be like that and over here, and I'm not going to worry too much about the detail there. I will have a few tufts here, I think. And then over here, so then I've got, oh look, I've noticed another little hill. So there's another little hill here. And doing this process, you don't have to actually design a travel poster but it's a useful exercise to do to let yourself simplify things and almost treat them um, as a graphic so I've got this nice little ring of trees here that goes around the corner into the shadow and it's just over here and in fact what I'm doing is actually squishing it up that way but I want to do that uh, we've got some trees here so I'm not going to worry too much about them and then we've got this further away little hill that goes into a forest so I'm just going to add the foresty bits over here and just looking at the general shape so you can simplify everything and here we have a hedgerow it will fit on there's a hedgerow over there and then we've got the shadow here so again we've got the shapes of trees and the shadow catching them and so that's that one and then we've got this nice one here I just want to catch that shape and actually if people know this because it's by Ditchling Beacon uh, I think a lot of people will recognize the shapes because you know you go out there for a walk and there are all the shapes and we've got another little hillock over here and this is the weald which is not quite as hilly as the downs and then we go up to Chanctonbury Hill which is kind of lost in the mist but I think I might turn that purple so I'm not going to do too much more to my design what I'm going to do now is actually transfer it using layout paper. I'm using trace down. I don't know if people have come across trace down. Um, so I'm just going to tear that off. Excuse me while I work through this. And I'm going to grab my piece of watercolour paper, which I have actually measured up. So here we are. So this is a piece of watercolour paper. And so again, the outer edge is A3, so I gave myself a little margin. It doesn't really matter if I uh, stick to it or not, uh, thinking about uh, the uh, reproduction process, but not that they are being reproduced. And then, so I have Trace Down, which is basically carbon paper for artists, and I've got a 2H pencil. So what I'm going to do, oh, is that going to work? Well, yes, it will work. Oh, is just put that there. Make sure I'm more or less lining up my image. It's here. There we go. So there's my image. It's lining up with the edges, I think. More or less. Take it down. Is that about right? Yes. 
I think that's probably about right. I'm just thinking about the lettering. Maybe I'll take it up a bit. Okay, let's do it that way. So as you can see, with layout paper, you can actually move things around a bit uh, to be your shape. And I often recommend doing this when you're doing oil painting as well, just so that you spend your time worrying about the composition at this stage, at a paper stage, rather than when you're committed to a canvas, particularly when you're doing life painting, I found. Every time I didn't do a good drawing before a life painting, I've spent three weeks trying to paint a foot because it's always in the wrong place. However, so I'm just going to press quite lightly because trace down sometimes doesn't erase. So I've got a 2 H pencil, which is very hard. And I'm just going to put my main elements in here. So I've got my five bar gate. And my other little gate. I'll worry about the details later because I'm going to attack this with masking fluid. Um, so we've got another gate there and then this rather odd thing on a hill. So there we are. So I'm just doing that. I'll just show you what's happening underneath. Ah, that's a bit dark. But uh, let's hope it does erase. Um, so I'm just, you can see how dark it is. So I'm going to start pressing lighter now. And I'm going to actually produce this design and then we'll start painting. What I'm going to do, I'm going to mask some of the edges of the gate, as I said. And then I'm going to actually uh, have to wait for that to dry uh, and then paint this. But I want to paint it in quite a simplistic style uh, to be uh, like a travel poster, but to simplify landscape. When you're out in the world, there's so much detail that enters your eyeballs. If you think, if you can think that, yes, I'm going to simplify that, that's a big help. So I'm just going to pop these on, just the basic shapes I put here. And I can worry about some more details later, I think. Um, so we've got this, this shape here that goes on to a little square shape there. Chanctonbury ring, which I believe is over there. And the wheel of Sussex. And then we've got some of this lovely patchwork. So I'm just going to put some patchwork in, just to remind myself it exists. So let's see what I've done. It's all often very good, if you are tracing like this, is to make sure that everything's in the right place. So this is better. This is not quite so dark, but I can work with that. This has ended up a little bit dark. Um, and then I just want to put that path in. So we've got a little hillock over here and this path that again leads the viewer into the painting. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to bring together my uh, uh, my watercolour drawing that I'm going to be painting on on this and put some masking fluid and then continue to paint once that masking fluid's dry. Um, I'm, I hope everybody knows what masking fluid is. It's a kind of uh, rubber cement, I think they describe it as, and it's like copy decks, basically. So I'm going to just go in there and add uh, the gate just so it's preserved and I don't have to worry about being too neat. OK, here we are, ready to paint. I tidied up my um, uh, drawing. And I've actually used a blue crayon. I rubbed out most of the um, trace down because it's a bit black. And I just went over the sort of ghostly marks of it with blue crayon. So I've actually almost constructed a jigsaw of how I'm going to paint this. So big, bold, flat colours. So we're painting in watercolour, which I think is the first time we've done this uh, on the video. So I just want to go through a few top tips. One top tip is to, with your paint box, these are my lovely Russian watercolours, they've seen, they've seen better days, but it's just to spray your paint box first with some, uh, just with a mist of water, and that sort of activates all the colours, that's particularly useful if you've got hard pans, so the colours hopefully will now be a little bit more active and it'll be easier to bring them up. <clears throat> but because I'm using... Um, more or less a limited palette, what I've done and what I'd encourage everybody to do when they're doing watercolour painting is mix up, <laughs> hard to tip it really, mix up puddles of the colour. So this is uh, some of the colours I'm going to use. I've got cerulean blue here and this is sort of an orange I'm going to use for the trees, burnt sienna, a purple and this is sepia which I did mention before in another video uh, as a nice cool brown quite useful for adding shadows and things. And then I have another little uh, palette here full of the other colours I'm going to use. And I just would like to go through some of them with you because these are un unusual colours that you don't often get in your paint box. And these are actually from tubes, although the Russian watercolours actually are quite good at simulating them. 
and always good to have a test piece of paper about your person. So what I'm going to do is just demonstrate a couple of watercolour techniques that are useful. And uh, when you're painting a watercolour, always good to have a test piece of paper uh, near you so you can see the intensity of the colour you've mixed up. Hard to tell in a pan sometimes. So um, I just want to go through these colours. <clears throat> so a couple of colours people might not have come across before. This is something called quinacridone gold, which is a kind of a greeny yellow. It's really nice, though. Very transparent. Uh, there's an interesting story about the quinacridone colours. There's uh, magenta and red and various other things. Um, it's uh, invented by Daniel Smith, uh, <coughs> who was fed up with all the colours, uh, the reds and the yellows being opaque. So he uh, invented the quinacridone range of colours from car paint, which is an interesting fact. And that was done in the last 20 or 30 years. So that's a very nice colour um, to uh, zing up some areas. And it makes a very nice green with Payne's Grey. I've got another colour here, which is one of my favourites. It's called Green Gold. I don't know if you can see. It's got this real zing. It really does look like sunshine through leaves. I'm not entirely sure if that hasn't got some chromacrodone yellow in it. Uh, maybe Indian yellow or something. But it's just gorgeous. Um, you can see it's got a nice zing to it. I'm just going to grab a slightly better brush. Let's try that one. Um, and uh, then this other colour, this is called Perline Green, which is a very, very cool green colour. So I'm just going to get a puddle of that going. Can you see? So that is also a very good colour for doing shadows, new trees and various things like that. Um, so that these come in... Um, the tube range and these are all Winsor and Newton. I've got sap green here as well um, from a tube uh, which works very well that's a nice grassy green so you can see and uh, then I've got uh, Payne's grey on here as well which is a nice colour for just for getting uh, darkening things down. I remember Keith was very against Payne's grey but I love it it's got this blue tinge to it and each maker paint is slightly different there's some that are really quite blue and some that are really quite gray so and these are all Winsor and Newton those are the ones I like um, and I just want to show you a basic technique of laying on a wash uh, so this is going to be pretty much big flat washes this painting so one way of doing it is you can wet the paper first um, and just you know, I'm going to be watching paint dry in a minute wet the paper first and then I'm going to pick up a good bunch of colour, a nice puddle I've made. This happens to be Payne's Grey. And you can see the paint is going on quite smoothly. If you wet the paper first, you get this nice smooth application with soft edges. <clears throat> and you can do all sorts of crazy things with this. Um, I could add water here and soften that edge like that. I will be doing some more watercolour demonstrations uh, in the next uh, wave of lessons. Another way of doing it is you have to use the biggest brush you can. This is a size 16, I think, or possibly a 12. And take up a big puddle of colour. And you can just go on like this. Because the brush is big, it's holding more paint, so you're not going back, diving back in and getting some more uh, paint while your paint's drying, and then you end up with those nasty streaks that no one likes. Can see so I've got a big flat area of wash there which has worked quite well I think. I'm just getting rid of that. So I'm going to use uh, basically these colours uh, in this painting. I don't know if you can see. So I've got cerulean blue for the sky. I've got these nice variations of greens and greys and a purple. So I'm now going to stab on and get going. Uh, so here we are. I actually um, tidied up this this is all masked now so I don't have to worry about my gate and I will go back and do the gate uh, with more detail later but I will have to wait for the wash to dry so you might not see the gate done until the final uh, picture so I'm just going to start with my cerulean blue I'm going to take a nice big brush and make sure it's clean you always have some kitchen towel on the go when you're painting watercolors because what you're trying to do is control water so I'm just going to pick up a nice puddle of this paint. Uh, this is Serene in Blue and I'm going to do my sky. So I'm just taking a little excess off there. Oh, I just realised what a big area it is. Hmm. I might wet it first because that is quite a big area. So I'm just going to wet this first and then I want to have some clouds in there too. So I'm just going to wet the top area first. 
and then I'm going to pick up my cerulean blue. I need my test paper just to see what colour it is. That's intense, it's going on quite well. So I'm just going to go over this area with my cerulean blue. And with watercolour, what you have to do is you have to sort of wait for the water uh, to do its work. The water will do work for you. And then I'm going to have try and put some clouds in here in a sort of stylistic fashion. And I'm painting a watercolour upright, which is something I hardly ever do. But let's go for it. I'm not going to worry about my edges because I can always trim them down. And I'm just going to soften that edge a little bit. So I've just got a clean, dry brush and I'm going in there to soften that edge. Although we're not using too many soft edges in this, but actually that's quite a nice effect. So with watercolour, you often have to be led by what the paint is doing. And if you go back and fiddle, it often ruins it. So I'm just going to go over here, soften that edge just with water so it's not too crazy. Um, and uh, because I'm painting upright, the wash is falling down. But never mind. Let's go in there, tidy that up a little bit. There we go. Leave it alone. I will leave it alone now. Uh, so what I'm going to do with this painting is um, it's a real simplified watercolour and it's quite a good way of getting into watercolours. Um, so I'm going to paint it like a jigsaw. So I've got that there for my chest so I can see what colour I've got. So I've mixed up here. This is a kind of purpley grey. Just want to see what that is. That's pretty perfect. That's a nice density of colour. And then I'm going to paint this area of Chanctonbury ring. So I'm just going up here and I'm using the biggest brush I can bear to use. I'm trying to remember what Chanctonbury ring looks like. And then it goes down to the wheel to Sussex. So I'm just putting that in. So that's kind of my first wave. And then I'm going to go in and soften that edge just with water. And often with, uh, with watercolour, what you can do, you can actually paint dark over light. So I'm just going in here, softening that edge. And I think I might grab a little bit of green. Uh, little tiny bit of green as it uh, that's too um, bright so I'm going to go in with perylene green which is a little bit darker so I'm sort of attacking this area the very far away I want to have uh, I want it to be misty so not quite so jigsaw like but a little bit misty just going to grab another brush and go in and just put a little bit of brightness in there because I can see some sort of the patchwork fields far away What's that coming down? Oh, that's that orange one, which I really want to put on. So with lighter colours, it doesn't you don't have to be too neat because you know you can paint those darker colours on top. And I want to grab a little bit of orange. And I can go back and paint. So there's this big orange field. I assume it's a field that hasn't been ploughed yet. In there. drag that round. So while watercolour is wet you can do all sorts of things with it. So I'm just going to bring that round and then I will put the hedgerows in later. And again I think I just want to soften this edge a little bit just with water because this area is dark and I know I can paint over that. Uh, <clears throat> now that's all wet so I'm going to have to leave that for a little bit. So what I might do is go on to paint the foreground. So what I'm going to use primarily is this lovely green gold. And I think I might wet it first because it's a very large area. So I'm just going to wet it first because I want to be a little bit more controlled here. I want I don't want to spray it because then it will go all over the place and then everything will be wet. Uh, a very useful tool for a watercolorist is to have a hairdryer, but um, uh, it doesn't make a terrible noise. So I'm just going to go over that. So I'm wetting that first. And then I'm going to pick up these nice pure colours. So I'm going in here with the green gold. I particularly want, whoa, look at that, crumbs. I want that path to uh, echo the shape of what's going on there. And there's some bright little edges catching the area there. And I'm just going to add a bit more water and catch some more of that green gold. I'm going over here. So these are slightly darker and lighter. So I'm just going to have this large area of this nice colour. And I notice up here what happens is it's catching the light more. <coughs> and I'm just going to go in there and add. So this is kind of my basic first uh, layer of paint. 
so that's now on there and I can have some things there so I'm just going to have that as one big colour and then I can go in and add some details <clears throat> and I'm going to let the the water do the work for me well am I uh, what I'm going to do is actually use a clean dry brush and you can take off some colour with that so a clean dry brush I want to catch that area there I want that to be a little bit lighter and watercolours always dry a little bit uh, lighter than you think they're going to be because at the moment uh, it's got this kind of glossy sheen um, it will oh dear I'm fiddling now um, it will uh, dry lighter than you think it is because you get this depth of color uh, color because of the gloss so I just want to go up there and tidy that up Oop. Ah. Mm -hmm. oh, damn I missed that bit right and you can see so that was okay uh, because my paint is still wet and then uh, is that dry dry ish yeah that's not bad nice hot day today so that's drying quite quickly uh, so then I'm going to paint this dark shape here. This is the hill before Chanctonbury Hill. I don't know what its name is, but it's a nice dark shape. So for that shape, I'm going to use my Perylene Green, which is this nice dark green, which is this colour. Whoa. And you see it's almost uh, grey, in fact. So that, that's a lovely colour for it. But I'm going to, I want to liven it up a bit, so I'm going to throw a little bit of purple at it. If I find me purple, which is over here. If you haven't got purple, the best way of making purple is um, French ultramarine and Elysian crimson. So I've got that, my perylene green, a bit of purple. Let's see what that looks like. Whoa, that's on the purpley side. Okay, so I want to paint this nice dark shape here. And I think the shapes are getting smaller, so I, I don't think I will have to wet the paper first. Uh, if you've got a large shape like this and you want the wash to be smooth, wet the paper first but here I think I can probably get away with it just using my big uh, brush oh, no, that seems like... ah, let's see what I've ended up with this time ah, I think I need a bit more purple and so I'm going in here and again so I'm just trying to follow the line and the theory is you should always use the biggest brush you can bear to use this is a size 16 sable uh, because it picks up uh, the paint that you need in the brush. Can you see it's all going on very smoothly because I've got a lot of paint on this brush. I'm not having to go back to my palette and add more paint. So I've got this nice shape here. Slightly less lumpy, but I'm not going to fiddle because that way watercolours go to hell in a handbasket. So I'm just going to leave that. Oh, no, I'm going to fiddle. And I'm going to have some bushes here. So just big shapes. So we're just concentrating on trying to produce big shapes. Uh, yeah, I'm going to fiddle. No, oh, never mind. Okay, this is still wet, so that's okay. I just want to get that contrast between this light area and the area behind. So don't fiddle too much. But again, now that's all wet. <laughs> I'm going to have to go to use uh, to a different area. So I'll probably do this area. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, dear. Um, so I'm going to go over here and actually uh, do this area so with the trees what I'm going to do is actually paint the lightest color first so I've got this nice big block of trees and I'm going to pick out the lightest color I'm going to paint that first and I can get their shapes in and paint the darker color over the wash that I've created so again I can't resist me green gold I might add a bit of sap green to it this time and see what color I've got yeah a bit green a bit more green gold required I think what are we doing? Uh, no, I think I might actually add a little bit of yellow to this and see what colour I got. Yeah, that will do. Uh, so I've got this big stand of trees here and I'm just going to go on and paint the whole thing this light colour. I think I should have used my bigger brush. Um, I'm just going to grab a little bit more water and put that in the wash and then it comes around the corner and then ends up in shadow. I'm just seeing what's going on here, and here, here, and there, and actually down here as well. Little bits of uh, the top of the trees are catching those areas. 
and oh yeah, there's some more going on down here. So you can put all the light colours in first and you can see I'm painting over the gate and not worrying about its shape. Um, I think I might take this. So I've got this big old bit of down doing this thing um, and that has dried now so I can actually pick up that colour and it's actually quite cooler so I might rely on sap green. See what colour I got. That will probably do is just the edge of this down <clears throat> is catching the light so I want that to be quite light and I'm coming down here to hit the trees and it's got this coolness to it so I'm just going to add a lot of water to that to soften those edges and I will going back in to add the darks oh damn my washes have mixed so I'm just going to catch it. I'm going to fiddle oh no don't fiddle and you find watercolours have these nice effects <clears throat> uh, that you get when you've made a mistake and then you add water to it and then the water adds uh, actually uh, uh, does something to the wash you've created. Um, oh yes, and I've got a little bit more up here. So I've got this up a little bit of down here. So I'm just going to pop that in and again make that quite wet. And then that's hitting that nice colour there. But I'm going to try and leave that to be discreet at the moment and then this it's all the interesting uh, foreground trees. So here, what I want to do is create this feeling of darkness there. <clears throat> and I'm going to use my perylene green. And let's see what colour that is. That is practically black. So I'm going to add a bit of sap green to that and buff it up. Uh, perylene green, sap green. So I want it to be quite dark. <clears throat> and I'm going in here and adding that dark colour. And this is why it's useful to have uh, <laughs> all these uh, colours already mixed. So I'm just going in here and catching, just catching the, uh, the light is just catching the edge of this down. I'm not going to worry about any drips at the moment. Um, and I might want to soften that edge. Um, so I'm just going to soften this edge along here, just with some water. <clears throat> and I would like that to be a little bit darker. What I'm going to do, because I created this wet wash here, I should just dab that off. Grab a little bit more perylene green. Uh, I just want it to be that little bit darker down here. And then this is also in darkness, so I can go along there. And then we've got these nice trees here. Um, I'm just going to tidy up this edge a little bit. And I think leave well alone. So this is a good exercise in not fiddling. So I'm just going to leave that colour. It's nice and deep. Um, it's just catching the edge here. I can't paint that until it's dry. So I can go back to the background. And you can always use your kitchen towel as a tool. So in fact here I might pop that in there. And then I can add the shadow later. So what's going on here? Again, this is perylene green, so this is quite a deep shadow, but what it's doing is defining the trees in the foreground. I'm just going over here, getting that perylene green going. Whoa! That's why you should always test. So I'm just going to pop that in there to, just to, and then I've got these trees in the foreground that this dark shadow is are defining. And hopefully, ah, uh, It'll all be right in the end. Uh, so what I can do while that is uh, drying, I suppose that is dry, um, I can think about this uh, further away um, a bit of down. It's a bit flat, that, and I think it might need a bit of lemon yellow. A cool, uh, sort of greeny yellow. I'm just going to pop that in there. So that's just the edge of it, and then I'm coming down here. If you're delicate enough, uh, it, you can actually not go over the previous wash, what you've just done. Um, I do have a nice exercise that's kind of uh, imitate a boutique uh, design where you actually leave white areas in between each wash so they don't mush together. So here again, I want a kind of cooler green, so I'm going to go for perling green mixed with sap green, I think. With a tiny bit of purple, maybe. What colour is that? Yeah, I think I'll have a bit of paints grey in there too. See how we're doing in that. Ah, a little bit more paint spray. Ah. 
and I'm just going in here and I'm going to add that sort of stand of trees there and this so that darkness again is defining the light of the trees in the foreground okay so we've got some nice trees going on here so simplifying a landscape into big blocky shapes there we go let's move that off right sorry i get very involved with the painting here so you can see this is quite simple way of painting um and what i will do is wait for a lot of these washes to dry oh no i'm fiddling don't fiddle anybody who's been one of my watercolor lessons know the great cry is don't fiddle i just want to make that a little bit darker there and possibly there oh god let's take it all the way down why not eek that's why not never mind <clears throat> so this is almost like assembling a jigsaw so i got this bit then i got that bit then that bit that bit and that bit and what i'm going to do now is look at these lovely uh golden trees i don't know if this was at the end of the summer so i can pick up my um nice bright green i'm going to make a, a brighter green with kind of yellow and a bit of the green gold let's see what color i've got oh will do um and so i want to take this nice bright color along there because this is the feel behind these nice brown trees okay um i have a little brush okay so a bit more green gold yeah and there's little little bits poking through but now I will have to wait for that to dry. But you can see I can paint over my gate and I don't have to worry about uh, that interfering with something underneath. What I might do is actually use my kitchen towel, go in there and dab some of that uh, colour away so that when I paint my nice sort of brown trees, my nice golden trees, there will be some lighter area underneath. Okay, now <clears throat> Kate Osborne taught me a good trick that if you feel the paper and it feels a bit cool, it means the paper is still wet. Um, so this is actually dry now, doesn't feel cool. And I'm going to go in and try and describe those trees. Um, I've got this nice little Chinese brush actually, which I find very useful. Uh, they're quite good. They've got a good point. So I'm just going to pick up some darker colour. The... Uh, so I've got sap green, perylene green. So I'm going to define the, uh, the shape of these trees by uh, putting this darker colour on top. So the, the light is coming from there and I can almost get almost, well, I suppose not Chinesey marks, but a more precise mark with this little Chinese brush. It goes in here and there's a few catching the light. So I'm looking at the kind of shape that is needed. And again, big flat colour. So I'm going to leave that for a nice foreground tree. Um, and then we've got them going kind of around the corner. And I'm going to go back and probably tweak some of this area. In fact, I am going to grab some perylene green to indicate this shadow. And the shadow, I'm just going to put some in there. The shadow is kind of here. So that's really deepening the shadow, the shadow of that. <clears throat> there so meanwhile i suppose i could uh while this is all wet i'm going to go in and define some of the um path area so again i'm cracking on with me green gold can't resist it and i want to have the path more defined so here i'm just going to go on here and you can see you can put a darker wash over a lighter wash and in fact what i'm going to do now is just smooth that out with some water but not too much uh, if you fiddle with an area that's um, already pe got paint on it too much you start disturbing the, the color underneath so what I want to do is I'm just using water to indicate the darker color of the path and then you have some tussocks over here and I can do a few tussocks and indicate the sort of change in texture of the, the downs there we go and over here so I've got quite a big light space here, so I need some more tussocks. So I will take up my little Chinese brush 
and add some more tussets. So as the background gets, um, I'm sorry, as the foreground gets closer, you want a little bit more detail. So this Chinese brush is ideal for adding that detail. Actually, I'm not that happy with that, so I'm just going to use a little bit more water. And we'll get some tussets going on. And then over here, there are hardly any tussets, it turns out. Okay. So I just want to have a little bit of texture there. Yeah. I think I will describe that as design. And it's not sweating the small stuff with watercolour. So if I'm getting the effect I want, which I am, I can go back in and do that. And there's another nice technique, which I suppose wouldn't really be a travel postery thing, is a <clears throat> dry brush. So as I'm getting a bit further away, I can add a bit more texture with almost hardly any paint on my brush and that's called dry brush and I'm just noticing there's a nice shadow underneath um, the gate the gate itself is casting a shadow so I do want to put that in so we've got some things going on here and then <clears throat> we've got this nice kind of almost it seems like almost orangey bits of grass lurking around and then uh, I want to see if that's dry. That's not dry. Um, I think I, what I want to do is add a few uh, sort of hedgerows along here just to indicate the nice patchwork cut, uh, part of the down. So I'm just taking a quite a pale wash. That's a bit too green. I need a bit cooler, maybe like that. And I just want to add some patchwork hedgerows. So I'm just going to go along here. And I can drag those over and because it's very far away it's quite faint so I just want to indicate that nice patchwork of fields that you see uh, when you're standing on top of the downs so I just need to soften that a bit and I think I just might leave uh, <coughs> this stand of trees to be that plain colour um, oops, I've got a little bit of a run here and see that's the trouble with watercolour when you take your eyes off it for a few minutes it does something I can actually so keep your eye on it but on the other hand you just have to embrace the something that it does occasionally so I'm just going to soften those edges together oh look I can add a little bit more detail while it's still wet I just want to indicate the idea of that path coming towards you um, so then I just want to do these things here I'm just seeing how much time I've done uh, um, so I'll just indicate I'll just do one of these trees and then I'll finish it off and post the finished picture because what I'm going to have to do is um, I have to wait for this to be completely dry and then I can paint the gate and then I can take the masking fluid off and paint the gate but it's just a matter of um, uh, painting dark colors over light um, and then I just want to leave a few gleams so this is why I use masking fluid so I can catch the light falling on that gate without driving myself insane so I'm going to pick up uh, my nice little bright orange and throw a bit of yellow at it and I want to indicate the sort of edge of these trees so I just wanted to paint a tree shape so this is the lightest part of the tree that you can see which goes down here and actually that's quite dark let's have another one over there so this is the usefulness I've got my palette here this is the usefulness of mixing up the colors you need painting from a limited palette and mixing up the colors that you need at the time but with that I've just run out but never mind it'll be fine uh, and this is being a bit pale so this is kind of the light corona around these trees and again I'm stylizing the trees I can go right through the gate and I don't have to worry about that and there's another one over here just grab a little bit of orange from my paint box and these are all orange here um, so there's lots of trees and there's been some trees here and I'm a bit loath to go up there because I know that wash is wet but never mind it's fine well, I might do anyway uh, and down here and then you've got some light flashes of tussocks and goodness knows what else going on there so I'm just going to leave that little bit of light there um, and so those are, that's kind of the corona uh, being lit up by the sun of these nice orange trees so again we're being quite stylized but it's no bad thing 
also useful for sketching uh, when you're out sketching, if we ever get out sketching again, uh, to have this kind of simple way of working because often you're faced with either your companion or someone saying to you, uh, have you finished yet? Uh, to just be able to quickly get down the scene and add um, and paint very quickly. So if you can think about stylizing things. So that uh, that is all wet. So what I'm going to do now is actually pick up a little bit of the sepia which is this nice cool brown and I want to go in here in the center of the tree perhaps I should wait till it's wet I mean till it's dry maybe maybe oh I don't know getting a nice effect um, so you can actually wait for it to dry but I want to get this darkness in here and I want it to be quite smooth and I can go back and add some more shape to these trees but I might leave it like this the thing about watercolor the nice why I love it so much, you never know what it's going to do. And some of the accidents are happy and some of them are uh, terrible, but there are no mistakes, there are only happy accidents, which is a new mantra. I might get a tattoo of that. Okay, so I'm going to leave that and leave it to be this stylized painting. So I can do it quite quickly. And what I'm going to do now is let it dry, peel off my masking fluid, paint that up, and then, um, I'll show you the finished picture, but I have to wait for this to dry and then you'll be hanging around watching paint dry, which is not a good thing. Okay. Hello, so I finished off the painting. I just rubbed the masking fluid off with my thumb. Uh, you can actually get a special device to do that, but uh, masking fluid is very gloopy and viscous, so it's very hard to get fine detail, but I think this is all right. So I've got my little gleam of the gate and I've applied my lettering. So there we are, we have a travel poster. I will be doing more watercolours uh, in the next coming weeks, but I also have on my um, Lucy Parker face, uh, Art School Facebook account, I have got some good demonstrations of watercolours if anybody is unsure how to use them. It's starting from the basics and working up. Some just nice, simple exercises to help you do these. But this is one of them, in fact. So I will see you next week with another topic.